the last week of lectures. How did that happen? Where did this term go to? Of course, the most exciting one that you've had so far, right? Yes? Good? Uh, speaking of exciting, um, I think that today's lecture is the second most exciting that we'll have all term. Of course, the most exciting one's going to be on Wednesday when we talk about archaeal viruses. Uh, but um, these viruses that we're going to talk about today, the, the giant viruses or the algal viruses, are really pretty darn amazing as far as I'm concerned. But as you all know, I'm quite biased. So <clears throat> just um, to get started here, uh, this is really about the gyruses, actually, as one of my colleagues calls them, the truly enormous and really virions. Again, this whole business of you know, what's a virion, what's a virus. So, but these guys really do have ridiculously large virions. Uh, and by ridiculously large, you actually can see them under the light microscope, which is really pretty amazing. And there's no way they would have gone through any of those filters that Biogenk and his colleagues were using early on in terms of virus discovery. So big who is sort of the main take home message here. But partly because they are so large, they also have pretty amazing genome complements in terms of what's present inside their genomes. So many of them, and not all of them, again, you know, whenever he puts quotes up there, it means that some of them are and some of them aren't. Um, but a very large number of these large viruses do have icosahedral structures. So it's not just the really small cases. We have a small genome. It has to be icosahedral. Um, turns out that this is a pretty good system, apparently, for packaging genomes. Um, and curious that only viruses use it. Uh, there are some really fascinating issues having to do with some of these giant viruses and climate. So they're important on a worldwide scale, not just at the individual host virus interaction process. And again, as I mentioned already, it's not just that they've got really big virions, but their genomes are also extremely large. And what's coded in these genomes starts to begin to blur sort of what's a virus and, and what isn't a virus. We'll talk about some of the most recent discoveries as far as some of these viruses are concerned in just a second here. So key concepts again, why bother with key concepts? because they're really good things to review for, say, exams next Tuesday, Tuesday morning, 8 AM, right here, um, Scantron, the usual whole nine yards. Uh, one of the ridiculous key concepts here is what people call these things, other than giant viruses, that just flows off the tongue, the NCLDVs. It, hmm? So nuclear cytoplasmic large DNA viruses. Uh, just, again, horrible description here. Uh, we will talk about the abundance, and not so much the abundance of the viruses, but really the virus-host interactions with each other. And this is why we can see some connections with climate and some of the climate changes there. These viruses, um, we've talked about some viruses already that have an internal lipid in their virions. It turns out that these guys have at least one set, if not two sets, of internal lipid membranes inside the virions. What that means um, is still a really pretty open question. Um, we did talk about the pox viruses last time. They also, some of them, have an internal lipid membrane as well. One of my favorite terminologies, sort of here, this is one of my least favorite up here, the N um, NCLDVs, is the Stargate. Um, this is the mechanism which is used to release the genome from most of these, or at least the icosahedral, very large viruses. There's, we've talked a little bit about viruses that infect viruses before. So this example here is the virophage, and so how there are viruses which are infecting viruses. And in this case, it only really makes sense when you think about a virus is that whole virus life cycle with virions going in, taking over the cell, et cetera. And so if you have another virus that's parasitizing on that process, um, would make a lot of sense. And in fact, these virophages are really good examples of that. Um, we may or may not have a chance to talk about CRISPR um, right down here at the end. Turns out that there are some of these giant viruses 
that encode their own CRISPRs, which is really not terribly surprising. If you're getting infected by a virus, then you want to have a protection mechanism against some of these viruses. So, uh, but we'll, we'll see if I have a chance to, to talk about this. This is really quite recent stuff here. Um, so, large nucleosized cytoplasmic DNA viruses. Um, these are the groups that we're going to talk about today. Um, first, the FICO DNA viruses. And again, people love to call these FICODNA viruses. No, FICO DNA viruses. Um, these are some of the most common viruses probably on the planet. These are infecting algal species that are present really pretty ubiquitously, particularly in the oceans. One subset of those are the coccoliths. Um, coccoliths are these really amazing um, algal structures that also have calcite shells on the outsides of them. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, hopefully, everyone's heard about the Mimi virus before. Yes, Mimi virus means something to you. What about megavirus? Heard about megavirus? Less of you. Uh, part of this is sort of, you know, eh, my virion is bigger than your virion. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about this. Two, in fact, French groups have been uh, sort of competing with each other. They're both wonderful people doing great science, but there's a little bit of this, you know, my virion is bigger than your virion kind of thing there. Um, and that continues a bit with the Pandora viruses and the pithoviruses, which are actually the very largest of these viruses that have been found so far. And I just threw up this image. It's not in the notes that I posted here, but basically as a reminder that so far we've just talked about almost just talked about viruses that infect you know, this very small group of organisms here. And then we had one lecture on all the viruses that infect this one very small group of organisms here. These giant viruses are mostly associated with all the rest of these eukaryotes here. And it's only very few of these that have been studied so far. So there's a really huge amount of work to be done here, also in the bacteria that are not E. coli and the archaea that we'll talk about on Wednesday that are not sulfalobus. So there's <clears throat> huge amount of opportunity, I like to think of, um, in terms of thinking about viruses infecting various different hosts here. But let's concentrate on these <clears throat> NCLDVs. Uh, we already talked about one group of these. These are the pox viruses. Um, there's another whole chapter in the textbook on baculoviruses. These are large virion viruses that infect insects. And again, infection of insect viruses is a whole new, different set of viruses that we haven't had a chance to talk about. Um, iridoviruses also infect insects. But the main thing to look at here is sort of the size of each of these. This is our, you know, 100 nanometer scale, so the pox viruses are big, iridoviruses are bigger, and of course the Mimi viruses are even bigger than that. And for scale, you know, this poor little herpes virus, which actually is one of the largest ones we've talked about beforehand, um, is pretty tiny, relatively speaking. The other thing that I wanted to mention here is that it's not just the sizes that make them similar to each other. It turns out that the sequence similarities between all of these viruses. So the pox virus is related at a sequence level to the Mimi viruses, which are related to many of these other ones as well. So there are some genes that are conserved in these viruses to the exclusion of pretty much any other sequence. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Let's start talking about the FICO DNA viruses. Um, FICO for alga, DNA viruses. And here the quote is um, algal. Now, algae are a massive group of organisms, and they're not really a good phylogeny. Um, this is a descriptive term. Uh, one of my favorite examples is kelp. You know, kelp is an algae, and these things get to be you know, 50 feet long. Um, as far as I know, no kelp viruses have been isolated yet, so it'd be a really cool system to go and look at. But um, main thing here is these are photosynthetic eukaryotes. And these photosynthetic eukaryotes probably contribute 50% of the oxygen on our planet. So <clears throat> very, very, very important for all of us organisms that like oxygen. 
um, which is you know, clearly all of us and, and many of the other ones as well. One thing which really blew me away is that 20% of these algae apparently are killed on a daily basis due to virus infection, which is also really kind of amazing and mind-blowing that that's what's happening just on a, a viral scale. The best study of these is probably PBCV1, again, horrible abbreviation here, um, Paramecium brucella chlorella virus. Um, the main reason that people study this is because of this guy up here, um, Jim Van Etten, who basically figured out a way to get these viruses to plaque. And this is a plaque assay um, now on green algae, so it's a green plate, and the reason it's green is because all of the host cells in the background here are chlorophyll containing, and then all of these little plaques come from each of the viruses, PFUs, that were present in that particular preparation, and basically this plaque assay got him a science paper and got him inducted in the National Academy of Sciences. This was admittedly a few years ago now. He, he likes to claim he's the only member of the National Academy in the state of Nebraska. I'm not sure if that's still true or not. Um, but <clears throat> really wonderful system. And he worked out that basically whenever you go out into a pond, um, you can find paramecium. And so this has been a little bit cut off at the top here. But many of these paramecia are chock full of these chlorella algae on the inside. And they, the paramecium seem to eat these, or at least try and eat the algae, but the algae survive on the inside, then they photosynthesize, and actually turns out to be good for the paramecium. But you can isolate the chlorella from here and grow them actually really easily in the lab. And how easily you can grow them in the lab is, um, this is my lab down here, and here we are um, growing these particular chlorella um, algae um, here. Work great, you can get very large numbers of them, and you can actually see the infection process, and even more importantly, the lysis process. So under the microscope, you can look at these um, algae, the chlorella algae, and literally you see them burst um, from the, the virus infections, which is, I should have brought a video of that, I don't have one. Um, they also have very interesting genomes. This should sound very familiar based on two lectures ago. Um, they are quote-unquote linear, double-stranded DNAs with closed hairpin ends. What does that sound like? Oh, man, it was sunny this weekend. <laughs> Pardon? Pox viruses, exactly. So the genome structure here is extremely similar to pox viruses, and probably replication happens in a similar way, getting nicks and then rolling hairpins. So this hairpin end structure with inverted terminal repeats seems to be a pretty good mechanism for replicating your genome, even if you've got a really big genome. Um, again, inverted terminal repeats. So the genome structure and replication is extremely similar to what's going on with the pox viruses. On the other hand, what's in the genome is really pretty wild. And um, this is a whole list down here. No, I don't expect you to be able to read it. But a few of the interesting aspects of these <coughs> giant viral genomes are that not unlike pox viruses, they've got a lot of the genes that they need. But this one is really interesting. It's got 11 tRNA genes in it. Now, remember, OK, translation is all supposed to be cellular stuff, right? All these viruses are supposed to be taking advantage of the cellular translation machinery. Well, yeah, but we're going to bring some of that translation machinery along with us because we figure it's going to be pretty important. Um, also, ubiquitin. Turns out that these viruses bring their own ubiquitin modification system with them. And so stability of proteins is also being regulated by these guys. They have very large numbers of transporters that are encoded in the genome. Well, okay, viruses are supposed to be using the metabolism of the cell, right? Well, this one's clearly changed that metabolism pretty drastically in terms of bringing in all of these extra components that it happens to need for replication of the virus. Yeah? Sorry, for the tRNAs, did they, uh, did they specifically be encoded on the code for different amino acids than the regular ones? Okay, so the question is, um, what about these tRNAs? What's, what's bizarre and different about these tRNAs? Um, are they different than cellular tRNAs? 
Um, and is it basically a different genetic code? Maybe is another way of, of putting it. So the answer is no, it's not a gen different genetic code. But if you look at the tRNA components of most organisms, and including some of these algal organisms, uh, you'll have more tRNAs that recognize certain codons and less tRNAs that recognize other codons. And what these viruses seem to have evolved to do is they have a very different codon usage than the cellular codon usage. And to be able to use those particular codons, they have their own tRNAs that help them to translate those viral genes. And we'll see that there's so more and more of that as we go through this. It's just the tip of the iceberg, as it were, in terms of some of these things. Um, another really fascinating aspect about this viral genome, very few introns, but one of them is actually a self-splicing intron. Um, in fact, the smallest self-splicing intron that was ever found. And so it's not just, uh, remember with the talking about the pox viruses, what was one of the really fascinating things about pox virus mRNAs? They're all made by the pox viral RNA polymerase. Was there any splicing machinery in the cytoplasm? No. But if you have a self-splicing intron, then you can still get some splicing to take place. Um, and so that seems to be one way of dealing with it. Now the structures of these um, virions, they're also icosahedral, but have a slight difference to them relative to your sort of you know, classic, regular, quasi-equivalent um, icosahedron. They do have very normal looking, anyway, um, capsid protein structures. And this is in fact one that I printed out right here. They've got these double beta barrel structures. And this double beta barrel, we've seen before, way back when, again, very beginning of the course, we talked about thinking about virus evolution and potentially really old relationships between different virions. And it turns out that there are archaeal viruses that have this structure of their major capsid protein. These are now infecting algal eukaryotes. And there are also bacterial viruses that have this particular structure. And I just brought it here so you can take a look at it. This is this double beta barrel structure, comes together as a trimer, and then all of the hexamers that are put here together will make up your whole virion. Um, this also has, this is the first example that anyone saw of what they call trisimetrons. I don't like the name nomenclature here, but it's nicely colored here where you've got your hexameric subunits that fit together as triangles. This is a lot like you'd see with your soccer ball, only they're offset slightly around the five-fold axis of symmetry. Um, so five-fold axis of symmetry, five-fold axis of symmetry, five-fold axis of symmetry, and these trisimetrons in between. You'll also notice that at one of the axes is a spike, and this should be really reminiscent of what whole set of viruses that we talked about way back when at the beginning? Coronaviruses. Not so much. The coronaviruses have spikes all over the place, but what about icosahedral that have one vertex that's different? Lambda, T7, Many, many, many of the bacteriophage, any of these tailed bacteriophage, have one particular place that's very different. And here it's just a single spike present at a single one of those five-fold axes of symmetry. Not surprisingly, it's that spike which is used for genome entry. So exactly what we see with the bacteriophage, even though these guys I forgot to mention, as well as having a big genome. Um, so how big is pox virus genome, approximately? 200,000 base pairs. These guys are 350,000 base pairs, so considerably bigger. The virions are about 400 nanometers across, so also very large here. What happens in terms of the infection process? Here's our virion. Um, you can't see the spike here because the resolution isn't high enough, but we know that it's the spike that now interacts with the cell wall. On that spike are a number of enzymes, which should also sound really familiar based on what we saw with T4, which break down the cell wall. Lots of these eukaryotic algae have very tough cell walls. 
So enzymes which are here, breaks down the cell wall, and then you have this release of the genome from the inside, probably through a Stargate structure that we'll see in just a second here. And then the internal membrane, which is present here, fuses with the plasma membrane, and the nucleic capsid is released, but the overall capsid is left on the outside. So again, this looks a lot like what you would see with the bacteriophage, only these guys are much, much bigger, almost twice the size of what you see with a normal um, structure. Then, hole in the membrane, this nuclear capsid gets transported to the nucleus. Once it gets to the nucleus, there are other enzymes there which break down the nuclear DNA. And that broken down nuclear DNA then gets used to make viral genomes. And so here, instead of having your own ribonucleotide reductase, having to deal with all the RNA which is present out in the cytoplasm, which you see with all the pox viruses here, just go to the nucleus, chop up all the DNA, and use it to make more of your own genomes. And that process works incredibly efficiently. Here's a poor infected chlorella cell with these virions that have been assembled here outside of the nucleus, and eventually you get enough of these that build up that you literally lyse the cell. And I you know, saw one of these pop um, under the microscope um, while I was watching an infection here um, that was going on. So it's very much like a bacteriophage replication system, except we're now working in eukaryotic cells. Again, they've all got nuclei um, here that <clears throat> used to have DNA in them. Now, of course, all that DNA has been incorporated into these uh, FICO-DNA virus um, genomes. So any questions on these PBCV1 in particular? I'll talk about another set of FICO-DNA viruses now. These are the coccolithoviruses. This is one of my favorite SEMs of all time. Um, these are these coccolithophorbs. Again, these are eukaryotic photosynthesizing algae that have these calcite plates around the outside, except that this one's particularly unhappy because it's got a nice little virion perched on the outside of it. And so this guy is going to infect. Now, how it gets through these armor plates on the outside is still a pretty open question, uh, but it certainly does. And then when you have lysis, like you have here, this is a chlorella virus, but the lysis seems to happen the same way, you burst open the cells, you end up blasting off all of these plates. Um, which, if they're not associated nicely with individual particles, end up reflecting light. And you have so many of these things that reflect the light that you can actually see these broken apart coccolithophores from space. This is the, well, the southwestern part of England um, where all of the... Uh, nasty things just happened is about here um, in London. So this is Penzance and then off the coast of Plymouth, which is where my colleague is who wrote this chapter, Willie Wilson. Um, but these, um, people talk about these you know, plaques. It's a plaque that you can see from space. So you have plaques on Earth. So the Earth is your petri plate and then these guys have little plaques on them. And so, um, and the reasoning is because you have very large numbers of these coccolithophores. This particular one is called Emiliana Huxleyi, and um, this was a bloom in you know, the late 90s, but you see these really quite often, and if there's not too many clouds, um, you can see these huge amounts of, of calcite which has been released from each of these individual particles. And people say that these massive blooms, what happens once you've released all this calcite, it's really like chalk, it will sink down to the bottom of whatever that ocean is, and then get uplifted. And have you heard about the White Cliffs of Dover? Yes? Did you know that they were all due to virus infection? Because probably most of the chalk that is there is due to all these little platelets that have gotten blasted off of those coccolithophores. So a geologic record of virus infection. 
It's a little bit controversial, but um, it's a really cool story, I think. Um, so this is what's happening with these coccolithoviruses. Um, one other thing that happens, because you've got such large amounts of these, this is probably 10 to the 20, 10 to the 21 of these Emiliana Huxleyi, which are getting blasted apart. So not surprisingly, you have quite a lot of whatever is on the inside here that gets released. And probably the best understood of those are some of these sulfur compounds, um, dimethyl sulfoxide and dimethyl sulfoxide uh, <coughs> phosphate, which then are gaseous. They get released. They go up into the upper atmosphere. And in the upper atmosphere, they nucleate cloud formation. So you've blasted open these photosynthetic organisms that then lead to the production of clouds, which of course is now going to block the sunlight from coming in. And so you're going to have less of these algae. So there's going to be less of this whole cycling going on. And so this is really kind of a self-regulatory loop here. Photosynthesizing, large amounts of photosynthesis, you'll end up making large numbers of the host. The virus comes in, kills them off, releases the DMS, which causes more cloud cover, so you don't have as much growth. So it's sort of a self-limiting process here, but really critical that you have the viruses involved in that loop. Yeah, Ian. As far as we know, the only way you can get that amount of DMS released in one big burst is due to a bloom. And so this is your know, massive amounts of the algae growing and then those algae dying off. And the die off is pretty clearly due to virus infection. So yes, is the answer. Probably that's the only way you get a big you know, puff, as it were, of, of dimethyl sulfoxide. So viruses um, can change change weather, which is also really bizarre. Geology, changing the weather, plaques you can see from space. I don't know. This When I first heard about this, it really kind of blew my mind. Uh, but also, if you look in the genomes now of these viruses, also you see some really interesting things. Um, first one is that, like a lot of viral genomes, these have a bunch of genes in them that don't look like any other gene anybody's ever seen before. It's about 80% of those don't. But there's a pretty clear RNA polymerase present in these. Um, oh, by the way, EHUX, you know, EHUX virus 86, it's just one of the viruses which they've found there, um, infecting Meliana Huxley virus number 86. A um, few other things that are important here, um, they encode apoptosis genes. And so, in fact, caspase genes, they seem to stimulate the activity of some of the caspase genes late in the infection process. And so apoptosis is actually what seems to be blasting apart these cells. Um, but it's a virus-induced apoptosis as opposed to a normal cellular-induced apoptosis. The way that that happens is the production of this lipid called ceramide. Um, ceramide is often used in algae, but also other systems for stimulating apoptosis. So it's a specifically modified lipid that basically says, hey, you know, stuff's really going bad. It's time to undergo apoptosis. Here the viruses have specific enzymes which are important for making, in fact, a slightly modified version of ceramide. And you can actually, you, in theory, um, some of the oceanographers will literally take their boat and sail it across the North Atlantic looking for this ceramide production. And they use this as a proxy for the virus infection that they've seen as moving across. Because it turns out it's a very virus-specific lipid because the only genes which make that particular ceramide-like lipid come from these virus genomes. So it's a way of looking at, at viruses and virus infection um, on literally oceanic scales. Um, this process, we already talked about the climate change. Um, it may serve as a bit of a buffer. So again, this is a feedback loop. If you have 
too much algal blooms, then you end up with DMS, you get a little bit more cloud cover, you slow down that whole cycle, potentially a global warming aspect. How many have heard about ocean acidification? What's one of the major problems with ocean acidification? Corals is one problem. What else? Decreasing the concentration of calcite. Decreasing the concentration of calcite, which is going to do what? Not allow these guys to function. So we may not even be able to get these kinds of, of feedback loops as well. So, um, well, let's not talk about climate treaties. Uh, when I had a, had a comment, actually, in my molecular biology class last term, um, which said, you know, too much politics in molecular biology. So, which reminds me, all of you filled out your nope. evaluations? Not yet. Please go ahead, do so, and say how obnoxious the clicker questions are, because that's what we'll have for the next one, which we should all be getting 100% on, right? Okay, so the structure of the PBCV1 major capsid protein is most similar to the major capsid protein of lambda, herpes simplex virus, sulfalobus turret, icosahedral virus, simian virus 40, or tobacco mosaic virus. It's this structure right here. Everyone remembers it, right? You've got 40 more seconds to come and check it out. Okay, we've got a pretty good consensus here. Unfortunately, it's wrong. Uh, so the major capsid protein structure, again, like this, double beta barrels. Did we talk about the structure of lambda? Not really. We talked about any azicosahedral having a tail at one end, which is in a very overall idea similar to PBCV1. Herpes simplex virus. Now, actually, it turns out, and we didn't talk about this, or I should say Dr. Estep didn't talk about this, is that <clears throat> the structure of herpes virus is actually not dissimilar from lambda in terms of the actual um, capsid protein structure. SV40, it's got that funky still beta barrel structure, but a single beta barrel structure instead of a double beta barrel structure. And TMV, you know, sort of helical um, boring, et cetera. What does that leave us with? The one that I'm going to talk about on Wednesday. But I also mentioned before, sulfalobus turreted icosahedral virus. So that's the one where we found the structure that looked really similar to this, that looked as if we had viruses infecting archaea, bacteria, and eukarya that had the same kind of structures. So, but fortunately or unfortunately, so many people miss this that it shouldn't make a difference in terms of the overall scores, which does remind me, in fact, that I haven't uploaded your clicker scores. So in case you're wondering, they haven't been uploaded in a while. I will try and do that um, this week so that we'll, we'll know where we're at. Yeah? It's called the, uh, like in the photoviruses, the, the H2. The, did, we, did we see the insertion tube for genome mm -hmm. entry? And is that, it's not completely analogous to the H2. Is it the... Yeah, the structural spike, so the question is here, is it, is it analogous to the H protein, which is actually from FIX-174, not from, um, from T7. And that's the core, which then um, inverts and goes in there. Um, here's actually probably more analogous to the structures you have in bacteriophage T4, because those also have enzymes that are breaking down the structure of the cell wall, also in terms of lambda, which have got enzymes that are breaking down the cell wall, the peptidoglycan. 
So um, more analogous there. OK, so um, now let's talk about mimiviruses, or actually really the megaviruses. These are the really true giants um, in the virion world. Um, this is probably one of the most classic images of one of these virions. Here's our scale bar, 200 nanometers across. If you add the fibers on the outside, this is almost 700 nanometers or 0.7 microns across. Um, and again, this is getting to the level where you can actually see these virions under a light microscope. And so these up here are actually light micrographs of, in this case, um, a cell. And these are, by the way, all viruses which are infecting amoeba, um, particularly these mimiviruses and the megaviruses. Most of these giant viruses are amoebal viruses. And basically, the whole amoeba is filled with virions. Each of these little dots here is a virion. And you can see that here if you just stain the poor amoeba with a nucleotide binding stain. Um, all these little dots are virions. This particular place right here, the VF, that's the virus factory. So we talked about that when we talked about the pox viruses a couple of lectures ago. This is where all of the assembly machinery is coming together. And you're getting massive amounts of DNA replication happening right here. This spot over here is the nucleus. So it's completely separated from the nucleus. And these guys are replicating completely separately from the nucleus. They've got all of the machinery that they need in order to be able to make full virions. So this is, again, much more analogous to the, the pox viruses that we talked about before. Again, almost all of these infect amoeba. The amoeba are relatively easy to isolate. And these amoeba are big enough that even these very large virions are still relatively small relative to the whole cell size. And the amoeba, how do amoeba eat? They eat by engulfing things. And that's probably how these viruses do their infection, is they just hang out, pretend that they're food, and they get eaten by the amoeba. And uh-oh, the amoeba's got problems and can end up um, looking, looking like this. This is probably that very first step. Here's the amoeba, which has just engulfed one of these um, Mimi viruses. And it's not surprising that the amoeba were confused because we were actually confused for a long period of time what these things were. They were originally called Bradfordococcus. Um, they were, in fact, called a microbe to start with. That was the Mimi virus, actually, comes from mimicking a bacterium. So, mimicking a bacterium from the point of view of the scientists, but also mimicking the bacterium from the point of view of the amoeba. And it was literally over 10 years between the discovery of Bradfordococcus and Mimi virus. And people just wouldn't believe it. People couldn't believe that this was, there was a virion that was this large, all kinds of you know, weird organisms that were found in amoeba anyway. Um, the whole group that found these, in fact, in the first place, they work on rickettsia, so these obligately intracellular bacteria. And that's where they were brought into this whole study was, okay, we're going to study this bacterium that seems to be infecting the amoeba. Oh, hmm. Actually, if we look at it carefully, it doesn't look like a bacterium at all. Um, and probably most importantly was the sequencing of the genome. And this is where it became really obvious that this was a virus and not a bacterium. Uh, genome itself is, in fact, <clears throat> pretty similar to what we've talked about before. Double-stranded, closed hairpin ends, et cetera. Only this guy's a million base pairs in length. In fact, over a million base pairs in length. Incredibly tightly packed genes, again, not too dissimilar from a bacterium, but no ribosomal RNA. Lots of tRNAs. I forget exactly how many there were in here. 
Um, also, as well as the tRNAs, they have amino acyl tRNA synthetases. So not just the extra tRNAs for those rare codons, but the amino acyl tRNA synthetase to put an amino acid onto that tRNA in such a way that you end up with getting really good translation that takes place there. But again, no ribosome encoded in the viral genome. So it's still dependent on the ribosome, but it's got a cap binding protein. It's got most of the translational initiation factors. In fact, an EIF4E homolog, which seems to be used. So it's getting pretty independent in terms of being able to replicate by itself. Um, also has, again, its own DNA polymerase, its own RNA polymerase, and again, a lot of translation machinery, but still, still no ribosome yet. So what does the structure look like if you get into a little bit higher resolution here? Um, this was also part of how the two actually French groups that were working together at the time um, were showing that this was a virus and not an intracellular bacterium. Um, here is that particle. And this is the Mimi virus particle here. Multiple membranes. You see, here's a, this LM here. Two membranes on the inside of this mostly icosahedral structure through cryo-EM. It's a pseudo T P equals, oh, sorry, pseudo T equals 1,179. I won't ask you to back calculate the number of particles from there, but it really is a pseudo-equivalent structure, mostly made up of one single capsid protein. Still amazing. Some of these large, again, this is, this is huge. You know, the, the actual capsid itself without the fibers is about 400 nanometers across, but still regular icosahedral symmetry the way that it's put together here. There's also a pretty clear protein core on the inside, and you'll notice one of the axes here, I should say one of the five-fold axes of symmetry, has a little bit of a hole in it here. So um, looks a little bit different, relatively speaking. People have asked, what are the fibers about? The fibers are probably actually just there to fool the amoeba into engulfing it. And they don't seem to be involved in the actual genome release process. The genome release process is the Stargate. Um, and we'll take a look at this um, in an animation here just in a second. Uh, but when people did this original cryo-EM reconstruction, and again, we talked about cryo-EM way back at the beginning. All of you remember cryo-EMs are basically taking lots of pictures of virus particles and averaging them all together. And that way you end up with a relatively high resolution structure um, coming out of all this averaging process. Most of those original averaging processes basically assumed that the virus particle was completely symmetrical. Again, like our soccer balls. Doesn't matter which way you look at it. And then they looked really carefully at some of these um, things and they noticed again, like this, there was one vertex that seemed to be a little bit different. And the same thing was true with the PVCB1. And so they went back and looked at their electron micrographs. And what they found was that at one of those five-fold axes, if now you didn't allow all of the five-fold axes to be the same, then you saw one of the five-fold axes was really pretty different. So let's take a look at this. It's a bit easier to see on this animation. So let's go and look at the... This is from... one of the labs here. So now if you look at the reconstruction, hopefully you can see there's one of those axes that's very different from the other one. So we've got all of our five-fold axes, normal five-fold axes of symmetry here, all those little dots again, regular icosahedral symmetry, but one of them has this really very, very different structure here, um, and the one that they call the Stargate. Switch back over to here. So there's that Stargate structure right here. Here's a scanning electron micrograph of when you have this Stargate opening 
and being released here. Here's another one of them. There's their nuclear capsule on the inside. Anyone recognize what this is? Anyone seen the new movie? Aliens. So amazing. They already knew way back then that, you know, giant viruses, giant viruses. And then this is the other Stargate from another film that had to go with it. So, yeah. <laughs> What's the T number on an alien egg? I haven't gone and calculated. Extra credit. No. Um, actually, these look more like um, Pandora bars, actually. But we'll get to that in just a second. Um, so <clears throat> this is how they release their genome. Let's look at the infection cycle. So this is the infection cycle for Mimi virus. We have a... Infection takes place up here. One virion gets enveloped by the pura amoeba. Then over the process of about 12 hours, first you have formation of a virus factory. Uh, you can see in this process, formation of the virus factory starts to produce virions after about 12 hours. This now produces so many of these virions that it does literally lice the poor amoeba. And in fact, this is the way that people found a lot of these viruses. You go out, you collect amoeba from various different places, including Siberian permafrost, and look for lysis of your amoeba or take whatever samples you can find, put them together with your favorite amoeba, and try and convince it to eat those particles, and then end up lysing itself. Here's a really nice image of one of these virus factories here. You can see pretty amorphous, but then producing each of these virions coming out on the outside. And here, it seems as if the packaging process is really sort of the reverse of the release process. Looks like you're getting insertion of this DNA plus protein through the stargate before it actually gets released. This is the virus factory, and these are the processes which are being released from there. So this is all Mimi virus. The two French labs were working together as far as Mimi virus is concerned, and then they sort of went their separate ways and said, well, I'm going to find a bigger virus than you're going to find. And so the next one to be found pretty soon thereafter was the mega virus, because Mimi virus wasn't interesting enough. Um, this was in um, 2011. A slightly bigger genome. A few more amino acyl PRNA synthetases, um, and quite a few genes that actually were very different from the Mimi virus. And so first people thought, oh, these are all going to be the same. You know, Mimi virus, one Mimi virus, seen one megavirus, seen one of these big viruses. They're all going to be the same relative to each other. Turns out they're really not. And this also goes back to where you know, we haven't studied most of these things. The vast majority of viruses that are infecting everything other than humans, agriculturally important plants, and a few things that are infecting E. coli, most of those really don't know much about. So um, this, you know, the bigger virus, the bigger virus turns out to be, you know, really exciting. And so we end up with some of these, I think, interesting news reports. So. This is the uh, scientists discover megavirus. This is Jean Michel. Sorry about the volume. I thought that was going to be a little bit higher. You can, you can watch the lunch building a little bit later on. But the whole the whole is this is this is this virus. But of course, this was not the biggest, the biggest virus. And we'll have we'll have we'll see we'll see moving on, moving on here. Let's. let's
We don't care about Charles Schwab, no, do we? The megavirus, um, one of the things you'll also notice about the megavirus here, come on, is see this Stargate up here at the top? So very, very similar in terms of its structure to all of these other ones. The genome release process also <coughs> seems to be extremely similar. So everyone clear on the genome release processes? Yeah, Ian? Um, you might be getting the, the fibers. We also think that they think that they have the same or similar purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the fibers here are probably serving an extremely similar purpose as well. Okay, so what would the fibers be doing? Does that have to do with this next question? Picker question? Maybe, maybe not. Let's see. The Mimi virus genome was released from the virion via a portal, transcription, a stargate, a virion associated pyramid, SV40 large T antigen. T antigen, T antigen. If in doubt. I was going to put beluga whale, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> beluga whale, beluga whale. Beluga whale. We'll see. It's written yet. F. Beluga whale. <laughs> Drat. It's not on there as an option. Voting for large T, Ian. Quit voting for large T. Oh. I can see. I, I can see. Can see. <laughs> Five. Vote early, vote often. Yes. We haven't had gerrymandering here yet, have we? So yes, it's the Stargate, um, which is the whole process here. Um, and yes, no, it's not just the whole old movies and the T number of the alien egg um, before that. So <clears throat> I want to finish up with some of these even more bizarre viruses. One of the things that was noticed relatively early on in the study of these megaviruses and megaviruses in the broader sense, not just megavirus chiliensis, but also the Mimi virus, is that occasionally they would have a amoeba that didn't get as sick. I was like, oh, that's bizarre. You know, usually these guys are getting li lysed in 12 hours. So what's going on here? And they looked very carefully, and what they saw was in these larger virions were these tiny virions in the inside of them. And then they went back and looked. It turns out that this is a extra virus which is infecting some of the cells that are infected by these Mimi viruses. And in the case of the Mimi virus, it's the Sputnik virus, um, which they call the virophage. Uh, it turns out that this viral genome doesn't look at all like the Mimi virus genome. It's actually got pieces of the genome that look like phage, which is why they call it a virophage, but also pieces of the genome that look like archaeoviruses. Really very, very bizarre kind of things. And at first people thought, oh, this is just something that's you know, very specific to Mimi viruses. Um, then one of my colleagues um, working up at UBC, I tried to get him to come and work in my lab, and then he went north of the border. I'm thinking about moving north of the border. More political commentary. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> working on more of these giant viruses. Ah, it keeps changing this. So this is actually supposed to be Crow V, not crop. Spell check is, is horrible. So um, cafeteria roburgensis. Cafeteria has nothing to do with what you might find across the way here in Smith Center. Um, cafeteria is another unicellular eukaryote, cafeteria roburgensis and it eats all kinds of different things and probably at some of these giant viruses which end up then replicating in them. Um, this is the case here for the virus factory of cafeteria producing again lots of these large virions but then 
a bunch of smaller virions as well. These smaller virions are not, you know, the classic phage-like or some mixture of all kinds of different viruses. These ones actually look like transposons that people had found in genomes for years, DNA-only transposons. <coughs> and somehow this DNA-only transposon seems to have been able to have picked up a coat protein and now is able to function as a virus. And so this is really starting to muddy the waters as far as what's a transposon, what's a virus. If a transposon has picked up a capsid <laughs> protein gene and can infect something, is that a transposon or is it a virus? And is it just the presence of your capsid which makes a difference between a transposon and a virus or not? Do these transposons, are they derived from viruses? Was it a virus in the first place and then lost its capsid protein gene? Or are viruses coming from transposons that have picked up capsid genes? Maybe some of both. We don't really know. So um, these are some of these processes that are going on in these megaviruses, the giant viruses. I did mention CRISPR right at the beginning. It turns out that some of these mini viruses have CRISPR systems to protect themselves against these virophages. And they also call it, you know, Mimivir was the la latest uh, mechanism they were talking about there. So we've got our giant viruses, icosahedral shape. Some of them have genomes up to about a megabase, a little over a megabase. <laughs> this is so bizarre. You know, what else is going on? Well, of course, there are more viruses, more crazy viruses. Uh, this is now the Pandora virus found about four years ago. These have virions that are very clearly obvious in the light microscope, but they don't have an icosahedral shape at all. This is the shape of the virion. It looks really funky, um, sort of amphora shaped, um, various different ones. Here's another one here. If anything, it looks almost like these are more like pox viruses, except the scale bar down here, it's just two microns. These are over a micron in length. Like, wait a minute, this is bizarre. You know, how the heck do we know that it's a virus? You know, well, it's replicating intracellularly, lyses the cell. What's in the genome? Well, probably most importantly, what's not in the genome? What's not? Ribosome, exactly. But <laughs> these genomes for the Pandora viruses are two and a half million base pairs in length. And just to show this um, relative to other genomes, so the largest archaeal genome is slightly over two and a half million base pairs. The E. coli genome is three million base pairs. Here, there's some protozoans. This is eukaryotes now that have smaller genomes than this virus does. Wait, wait a minute, small? This doesn't look small to me anymore. I'll be you know, definitely getting rid of that part of our virus definition. Um, Pandora's box. Um, these, again, these French people who have you know, really active imaginations in terms of thinking about these things. Um, only 7% of the proteins which are present in this genome are similar to other known proteins. So it's very, very, very different, even though it was found to, in fact, acanth amoeba. So again, just a very similar system. And so probably many things, many, many different viruses that we have no idea what they're actually really doing and what they're <laughs> infecting, which can be found all over the place. Yeah, Alice? Are those to, other viruses or to, to anything, anything. So known at all. Um, but those that are known, those 7%, do seem to be related to the Mimi viruses and those other giant viruses. And so this particular group said, well, what we think is going on here, you know, since we've got this really massive genome size um, and mostly unknown proteins, we think that this is a genome which is actually derived from an ancient cellular lineage that said, hey, we don't need ribosomes anymore. We can infect other guys, right? So that was the thought. This was a cellular domain because these things were so different than anything an anyone else had ever found before. 
So this was what they were talking about. And this is uh, for about four years ago that they discovered this genome. Maybe there's a fourth domain of life that's out there. Um, earlier this year um, was a new genome sequence that was published, actually a metagenome sequence. This is a virion which they found in this wastewater treatment plant. Um, looks to me a heck of a lot like our megaviruses and mimiviruses just without the fibers on the outside. This is just a mega, uh, say, a metagenome sequences. So environmental sequences, put them all together, see what you find. Um, pretty big genome. Probably the most amazing thing to come out of this was 19 amino acyl tyranny synthases. How many amino acids are usually used? 20. So you've got amino acyl tyranny synthases for 19 of these, which is really crazy. Um, 25 different tRNAs for 14 of the amino acids, but still no ribosomal sequences. So, you know, getting closer and closer, I think, here. But the other thing that they did here, which I thought was a really nice part of the study, is they went and then looked at all of these amino acyl tRNA synthetases, all of the sequences that were similar to something else, and what they found is all of those sequences seem to be phylogenetically related to host sequences. And so there was a pretty clear phylogeny that you could make that said, no, this is not a derivative of a fourth domain. This is really derived from stealing a bunch of genes from the host. So instead of the idea, oh, we've infected a cell, we can get rid of our ribosome, it's the other way around. We're a virus and we're going to steal all these genes from our host and that will help our virus to be able to replicate. Yeah? Do you find those hostings to be pretty well conserved, stolen ones? So the question is how well conserved are these stolen genes? The answer is they're usually not very well conserved. So if, if anything that theft happened long periods of time ago, and it seems to vary relative to the different genes. And so if you look at um, particularly what they looked at with these amino acyl tRNA synthetases, because it's a very well-studied group of genes, and some of them seem to have been acquired very recently, and some of them were probably acquired a much longer time ago. Okay, I'm just going to finish with this one. Yes, my virus is bigger than your virus. No, my biggest is, virus is bigger than your virus. The pithovirus, um, the very latest to have been discovered here. Um, you may or may not have heard about this, um, again, about three years ago. This was one of those viruses they found in permafrost. So it was a permafrost sample that Jean-Michel, the guy whose picture you saw just a second ago, um, went with his lab, thought out some permafrost, tried to infect acanth amoeba with them, found that these poor acanth amoeba got really, really sick um, and got blasted apart. They went, then went and looked with the electron microscope and actually figured they didn't actually need an electron microscope. <laughs> they could just use a light microscope um, because this is just the size of this pithovirus, about 1.5 microns relative, again, to HSV and these other um, boring virus particles um, right here. There's actually a pretty good um, video article in Slate. I'm not going to show it now. It's a couple of minutes long. Uh, but actually talks a little bit about the hype that went with this and, you know, oh, no, we thought the permafrost were going to kill everyone because, you know, all these new viruses are going to come out. Well, you may be killing a bunch of amoeba, but um, no human viruses have come out of those yet. And even the flu viruses they got out of the permafrost were so broken apart that there's no way they would have been infectious. So with that, we'll talk about our kale viruses on Wednesday.